our study of DNA this spring, we will start with a macroscopic picture of DNA and zoom in closer and closer to gain a microscopic understanding of the topic. This is a picture of a human eukaryotic cell. If you stretched out the DNA in this single cell, it would be about 10 meters in length. As you know, the DNA is stored in the nucleus of the cell in structures known as chromosomes. Each chromosome is made up of double-stranded DNA wound around proteins known as histones. The double helix is composed of two complementary strands of DNA. This is a simplified diagram of a piece of double-stranded DNA. As you can see, it looks like a ladder that has been twisted around a central axis. Notice the arrows toward the bottom of the picture that are going in opposite directions. We will talk about their meaning later on in the presentation. Here is a slightly more detailed view of a double helix. You can see from this diagram that the backbone, or sides of the ladder, is made up of sugar and phosphate, and the rungs of the ladder are made up of the nitrogenous bases. Notice that A always pairs with T, and G always pairs with C. Pairings of A's and T's, or G's and C's, are known as base pairs. This picture is a bit misleading, as the spacing between the turns of the ladder is not equal as it appears to be in this diagram. In actuality, the spacing is unequal, as is shown in the diagram on the left. The smaller distance is known as the minor groove, while the larger distance is known as the major groove. We need to look at the double helix in some greater detail to better understand its structure. This diagram illustrates the different components of each strand of DNA. Notice the alternating sugar phosphate backbones of the strands and the nitrogenous bases that are paired together to make up the rungs. You can see that the bases are joined together by hydrogen bonds. This diagram is slightly misleading, however, as it makes it look like there are actually hydrogens in the middle of these bonds. Remember that a hydrogen bond doesn't actually have a hydrogen in the middle of the bond. Rather, it is an interaction between a hydrogen and another electronegative element, which, in this case, is nitrogen or oxygen. In some cases, there are two hydrogen bonds between bases, while in other cases, there are three. We will come back to this idea in a few minutes. Also, notice that the strand on the left appears to be written right side up, while the strand on the right appears to be written upside down. We will talk about this later on in the lecture as well. This diagram shows us some important details about spacing within a DNA strand. If the strand is not wound into a helix, the spacing between the base pairs is 0.6 nanometers. However, as DNA is normally in a helical shape, we are more concerned with the details for that scenario. The spacing between base pairs, in that case, is 0.34 nanometers, and it takes 3.4 nanometers for the helix to make one complete turn. What is each of the strands made of? As was briefly mentioned in the lecture on restriction enzymes, they are made up of individual nucleotides that are joined together by phosphodiester bonds, as is shown in this diagram. Here is a simplified version of this which is similar to many of the diagrams you have already seen that show two strands of nucleotides, each of which is linked together by phosphodiester bonds. As was mentioned earlier, the strands of DNA are connected by hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases. You can see here that A and T are always joined by two hydrogen bonds, while G and C are always joined by three hydrogen bonds. Notice that there is a fifth nucleotide, uracil, that is shown on the bottom right. Uracil replaces thymine in RNA, but it is not present in DNA. Now that we have closely examined the structure of the double helix and we know how each strand of DNA is joined, we need to look more closely at the building blocks of each of the single strands. Each strand of DNA is made up of nucleotides. Here is a very simplified diagram of a nucleotide, showing the three basic components, a phosphate group, 
a 5-carbon sugar, and a nitrogenous base. A more detailed structure of a nucleotide, specifically adenine, is here. You can see all the elements present, as well as the double and single bonds holding the structure together. This structure, on the bottom right of the screen, is almost identical to the previous structure, with one important difference. Pause the video to see if you notice the major difference between the two. Did you notice that, in the diagram on the right, there is a single hydrogen bonded to one of the carbons in the 5-carbon sugar, whereas in the diagram in the middle, there is an OH bonded to the same carbon? We'll talk more about this difference in a second. Also, notice that the diagram on the bottom right doesn't label all the carbons as the diagram in the middle does. Conventionally, the carbons at the corners are not labeled. In general, there are two basic differences between nucleotides. The first difference has to do with the five carbon sugar that is a part of the nucleotide. This diagram shows deoxyribose, one of the two types of five carbon sugars present in nucleic acids. Notice that the structure has five carbons, each of which is numbered, starting from the right and glowing clockwise. Deoxyribose has a hydrogen bonded to the two prime carbon. This is distinctly different from ribose, which has an OH group bonded to the two prime carbon. It makes sense that deoxyribose would have one less oxygen than ribose, and this was the difference you should have noted on the last slide. Also, it is important to recognize that a nitrogenous base is bound to the one prime carbon, and the phosphate group is bound to the five prime carbon when a nucleotide forms. The other way in which nucleotides differ has to do with the nitrogenous base that is attached to the five carbon sugar. Notice that the bases are split into one of two categories, purines and pyrimidines. When complementary bases pair, A with T and G with C, a purine must always pair with a pyrimidine. You may remember the diagram on this slide from a few minutes ago. At this point, you should take note of the three prime and five prime ends of the nucleotides with regards to the way they join together. The phosphodiester bond forms between the phosphate group attached to the five prime carbon of one sugar and the three prime carbon of another sugar. This is the diagram that results when enough nucleotides join together and pair with another strand to make double-stranded DNA. The directionality is important, however. On the left strand, the top is known as the five prime end and the bottom is known as the three prime end. On the right strand, the top is known as the three prime end and the bottom is known as the five prime end. The three prime and five prime ends are labeled based on the orientation of the five carbon sugar. You may remember a while back that I said to take note of the fact that two arrows in an earlier diagram were running in opposite directions. This is why because one strand is oriented in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction, while the complementary strand is oriented 5' prime to 3', prime, the DNA strands are said to be anti